the next speaker is Mikel Ocio. Um, he's studying a master in uh, Madrid. Uh, the master is física de la materia condensada y los sistemas biológicos. Um, uh, specialized, specialized in uh, biophysics. Uh, his uh, final, uh, final work of the master um, is, uh, is based in, in the description on a, of a biological system. Uh, and uh, he's uh, currently working in the CBMSO, uh, Centro Bio de Biología Molecular Severo Ochoa, and the IFIMAC, Instituto de Física de la Materia Condensada. Uh, I hope you enjoy this talk. Gracias, Ana. Well, uh, good morning. I'm Miquel Ocio, a biophysics master student from the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid, but I studied physics in Valencia. And I'm going to introduce you my master's thesis, which is a nice example of what uh, systems biology is, and also how we can apply physical techniques in such a different field as molecular uh, biology. So first of all, we should understand which is the system that we are going to, to study. So all cells from the simplest to the most complex respond to changes in their external and internal environment. The environment of a cell influences its growth, the differentiation, the tissue organization, the metabolism, the migration. So in this figure, we can see that cells need these extracellular signals even to simply survive. Also, they decide uh, the fate of the cell, as Gabriel explained. So depending on the signal, they can proliferate, they can differentiate. This means that they convert into a more specialized cell, like a muscle cell or a neuron, or they can also die in a controlled way. So the mechanism by which uh, cells communicate is known as signal transduction. Through signal transduction, the extracellular signals that can be hormones, neurotransmitters, photons, as we've seen before, are transmitted into the cell interior following a certain signaling pathway. There are different pathways depending on the molecules involved and the aim of the signaling, but they all follow a similar structure. So the signal molecule usually binds to a protein that is in the plasma membrane of the target cell, and this binding activates the receptor, which in turn unleashes a signaling cascade by activating these uh, intracellular signaling proteins. So these proteins transmit, amplify, and process the signal inside the receiving cell and distribute it to the appropriate uh, intracellular targets. So the targets that lie at the end of the signaling pathways are the effector proteins, which are altered by the incoming signal and implement the appropriate changes in the cell behavior. So these targets can be uh, metabolic enzymes, transcription factors, cytoskeletal components, which uh, modify the metabolism, the gene expression, and the shape or the movement of the cell, respectively. So <clears throat> in our lab, we, we study one of these pathways, the transforming growth factor beta, the TGF beta pathway, which is the name of these uh, extracellular signaling molecules. So the TGF beta pathway is one of the most uh, conserved and prolific signaling cascades. And despite uh, this uh, simple architecture, the pathway is involved in the regulation of many processes, including uh, growth, proliferation, differentiation, and survival. And it plays uh, key roles in development and cancer. So the architecture is very similar to the one that I've explained to the general one. So we have the extracellular ligands that activate these membrane receptors, which recruit and phosphorylate. This means that they activate the cytoplasmic proteins, SMAT2 and 3, which are known as R-SMAT proteins. And when they are active, they are phosphorylated, they form complexes with the SMAT4 that enter the nuclei. And these uh, heterocomplexes recruit other proteins, the transcription factors, to ultimately regulate the gene expression. So the, the SMAT signal transduction from the membrane into the nucleus is not something linear and unidirectional, but rather a, a dynamic network that couples the, the SMAT dimerization and dissociation through continuous nucleocytoplasmic shuttling of the, of the SMATs. 
So there are other types of SMAT proteins like SMAT7, which inhibits the, the signal transduction. And in fact, the, the interactome of the pathway is uh, incredibly, com uh, incredibly complex, as we can see here. So here is where our gel pass physicist uh, starts. So we are going to uh, describe this system using a simple mathematical uh, model. So we have developed this uh, simple model that describes the dimerization and the translocation process of the RSMAT complexes between the cytoplasm and the nucleus. So first of all, what we need to do is write down all the reactions going on with corresponding rates. And this is the dimerization and the dissociation of the complexes, as well as the translocation of the monomers in both ways and of the dimers. From these interactions that are like a chemical reaction, we derive a series of uh, ordinary differential equations which describe the evolution in, in time of each one of the populations, which are uh, the monomers and the dimers in the cytoplasm and in the nuclei. To check the validity of this model, we need to study the spatial distribution of the protein of interest. And I'm going to briefly explain a couple of techniques that we can use for that aim. So first of all, we have the immunofluorescence, which is a very usual technique in biochemistry which consists of uh, labeling the interest protein with a fluorophore that is excited at a, at a determined uh, wavelength. So we tag the target protein, that is the antigen, with an antibody, which is in turn recognized by a secondary antibody with that marker. So we can visualize where the protein is. And the other method is uh, more complex, but it is needed for the second part of the project and is the creation of a fluorescent uh, fusion protein. So fluorescent proteins are proteins with a well-defined absorption and emission spectrum, and they were first isolated in the 70s from, from this jellyfish here. They have this uh, barrel structure with the chromophore embedded inside, and what we did was to create a fusion protein joining the RSNATs 2 and 3 with CFP and YFP, the dark cyan and yellow fluorescent proteins. So this picture is not representative, uh, is not our, our fusion protein, but it's representative of what a fluorescent fusion protein is with the protein of interest and the barrel. So an interesting effect that we saw in the immunofluorescences was that the cells expressing more SNAP, this is the, the brightest cells, were in general more nuclear, like this one here or this one here. So we, we try to fit the model to the expression levels of the protein. And to do that, what we do is we numerically solve these uh, differential equations for different initial concentrations of the proteins. This is for different expression level of the protein. And we take the stationary values of the population in the cytoplasm and the population in the nuclei. So we obtain the partial nuclear intensity. So we can fit our model to our experimental data which is this percentage of nuclear intensity with respect to the total intensity. And taking the, the value of the rates from the literature, we are able to fit the model to the immunofluorescence results, which are the endogenous levels of the, of the protein expression. And this uh, differential translocation effect is explained by the nonlinearity of the model, since here we have uh, a square due to the dimerization of the protein. For the fusion proteins, we are also able to fit the model, confirming that the fusion proteins uh, have the same translocation dynamics as the endogenous ones, without the need of doing any biochemistry assay. And in addition, the model is able to, to describe the effect of different drugs that affect the activation of the pathway, like SB or Activin, by just changing the, the rate K1, that is the one describing this uh, the activation, the dimerization, and the, and the cytoplasm. But uh, which is the point of using fusion proteins? So here is where we go into the principal objective of the project, that is the development of a biosensor to detect the activation of this pathway in, uh, in in vivo cells using FlimFred, that is a biophysical technique. So to understand the, the technique, we will focus on the underlying uh, physical principle. So this is a Jablonski diagram, but it's a tool for visualizing the possible transitions that can occur after a molecule, a fluorophore, has been photoexcited. So the energy levels of our molecules are shown by the horizontal lines with the increasing energy along the vertical axis. 
and within its uh, electronic state we have different uh, vibrational levels. So when a molecule in the ground state is excited, it absorbs light of, of energy equal or greater than these uh, higher energy levels, and an electron is excited to a higher energy level for a short period of time. Then the electron will undergo a vibrational relaxation to the lowest vibrational state of the excited state. Is this process here or this process here? And this is a non-radiative process where the energy is dissipated, is lost uh, in the form of heat. And then from this uh, S1 electronic state, the molecules return to the ground state, either by a radiative or a non-radiative process. Radiative transitions are transitions where uh, photons are being emitted or absorbed. So fluorescence is one of these uh, radiative processes in which the fluorophores decay to the ground state by emitting photons and the time scale of the nanoseconds. Point is that the energy of the emitted fluorescence photon is lower than the absorbed. The emission occurs at a longer wavelength, uh, at a longer wavelength than the excitation due to this energy loss in the vibrational relaxation and the internal conversions. On the other hand, we, we need to define what is the fluorescence lifetime, tau, uh, and it is the average time that the fluorophore remains in this excited state. In this time, the, the intensity decays to one over E of its original value, and the decaying intensity at time T can be, is, it's a first order kinetics equation, summed across all the species in the sample. Here, for example, we have the function for the decay of a sample with two species. So we have uh, two lifetimes, tau, tau one and tau two. To obtain this, this function, we need to model the decay by a convolution, considering also an offset correction for the dark noise, A0, and also the, the error introduced by the instrument that is disturbed. So once we know how fluorescence uh, works at a molecular level, and how we can obtain lifetimes from the intensity decay of a fluorophore, we can study what is a flame thread. FRED, that stands for Forced Resonance Energy Transfer, is the distance dependent non radiative transfer of energy from one molecule, the donor, to another molecule, the acceptor. So let's see this with, with our system. We have one SMAT fused to a CFP, the donor, and another one fused to a YFP, the acceptor. So if the proteins are not uh, close to each other, we excite the donor at a certain wavelength and it will emit in a shifted wavelength due to the energy loss by this uh, vibrational relaxation that we have seen. However, if the acceptor is at less than 10 nanometers, there will be a non-radiative energy transfer from the donor to acceptor, which in turn will emit a photon at its correspondent uh, wavelength. So we will have signal in the emission spectrum of the acceptor revealing the proximity, so revealing the interaction between these interest proteins. The principle behind uh, this technique is that the emission spectrum of the donor fluorophore overlaps with the excitation spectrum of the acceptor fluorophore. Uh, so then the FLIM, because this is flim thread, FLIM stands for Fluorescence Lifetime Imaging Microscopy. It's an imaging technique uh, based on the differences in this uh, exponential decay rate of photon emission of a fluorophore in a sample. So basically we measure the intensity, that is the, the number of photons, respect to time, so we can fit the exponential to obtain the lifetime that we've seen before. And because FRET, because energy transfer is a process that depopulates the excited state of the donor, uh, the donor fluorescence lifetime is going to be shorter because, because of FRET. So if a molecule has several ways to decay from the excited state, the lifetime is going to be uh, shorter. So what we obtain with FLIM is a map of the spatial distribution of the lifetime inside uh, the living cell. So we can see, so we can measure these uh, shorter donor lifetimes resulting from, from the interaction, resulting from threat. So we can determine if the proteins are interacting and where they are interacting. So this can, talk, can be used to, to test the effect of different ligands and, and drugs, uh, as well as the, the specificity and the role of its, of its protein. And just to illustrate it, here we have an image of the cells in the cyan and the yellow channel. And we see how the brightest cells, that are these ones, are the ones with uh, shorter lifetimes, indicating the activation of the pathway. 
and also the localization of the dimers in the nuclei, as we've seen in the, in the scheme at the beginning. So summing up, uh, we've seen how to describe a biological system with a simple mathematical model and how we can uh, use it to characterize the dynamics of the proteins. So we can check that our, our fusion proteins are functional. And uh, on the other hand, we've seen a, a broadly used technique to detect the uh, protein-protein interactions that has uh, a, lot of, a lot of physics behind. So I would like to thank the members of the Biophysics and Systems Biology Lab uh, and the people at the service of optical and confocal microscopy at the Centro de Biología Molecular Selección. And also, thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you, Mikel, for your talk. Uh, now, if anyone has any question. Ah, okay. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, Mikel. Uh, hi. You said you solved those uh, nonlinear equations uh, by using which methods? You didn't mention that. Uh, can you please tell us how do you uh, do that? Yeah, one moment. So uh, let me share the, the screen again. So uh, we have uh, this set of differential equations and we just uh, solve it uh, numerically I, with with the predetermined solver from the from a lab it's not uh, so you use standard the, standard software okay okay i see other 23 yeah okay <laughs> good good no <laughs> fine thank you no. mm -hmm. Well, uh, if anyone uh, anyone has no questions, uh, we can finish. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, <laughs> Miquel. Thanks. Thanks. Hola, hola, ok, perfecto. Mm. Ah, bueno, sí. Ok, y el láser, ok, perfecto. So, we'll move to the next uh, talk. Here we have Luis Alberto Sánchez, who studied... Uh, he did uh, his bachelor in physics in the University of Sa Valladolid. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I get confused <laughs> between those uh, the cities. And he did his master's in um, um, laser physics and technology in uh, Salamanca. He's currently now doing his PhD here in University of Valencia in the laboratory of uh, fiber optics. And uh, he focused in study of uh, fiber acoustic fiber acoustico optics acoustic optics <laughs> <laughs> and um, the study of uh, nonlinear optics and fiber layers so 
you can start when you want. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So as he, as he said, today I'm going to talk about uh, fiber acoustic opti optics in uh, the applications. So probably a lot of people know what is an optical fiber, right? But uh, probably many of you uh, don't know that uh, optical fibers uh, can also be used in, acousto, in acoustic applications. So first of all, uh, let me just introduce uh, my research group, which is the Laboratory of Fiber Optics. This is the, the web page. So this is our principal investigation, investigator, Miguel Andres. Uh, there we have several PhD students and postdocs and collabor collaborators, and Manuel, he is our electronic engineer. Uh, this are, these are the, top, the research areas of our, our group. So in our group, as I told you, we use uh, optical fibers for a lot of applications. For example, we use optical fibers to create uh, optical, uh, optical fiber lasers. We also design uh, special fibers with microstructural um, uh, shapes. We also design and simulate these, these uh, fibers, optical mi micro resonators, fiber optic sensors. But today, I'm going to talk about my research which is uh, optoacoustics and optomechanics. So, okay, let's focus on the title of my, of my talk. Uh, do you know what are photons? Have you ever heard about photons? I guess you did. Okay, so photons are just quantized normal modes of electromagnetic waves. Um, they can propagate through matter and vacuum, and the energy and momentum is given by these equations. Just an example, for example, a photon in the infrared uh, wavelength in 1.5 microns is around 200 to 10 to the 12 terahertz of uh, frequency. A photon in the ultraviolet region is 1,000 terahertz. Okay, so as I told you, photons are quantized normal modes of electromagnetic mo waves. We can do the same with acoustic waves or mechanical waves. So these particles, or quasi-particles, are called phonons. In the same way as photons, phonons are, are uh, quantized mo uh, modes of lattice vibrations, mechanical waves. They can only propagate in, in matter. There are not acoustic waves in, in space, if there is no if it is vacuum. The energy and momentum is given as an analogy to photons by these expressions. And there are uh, several types of, of phonons. Uh, these are the two main types of phonons, optical phonons, which has uh, frequencies in the same range as the, as the photons, and acoustic phonons, which are uh, way more slower in frequency. In this talk, we will only focus in acoustic photons, phonons, which are in some way the macroscopic phonons. Um, but for this talk, we are not going to use the concept of photons and phonons, but we are going to use the, the wave theory for this uh, kind of, of, of particles. So in the case of electromagnetic waves, uh, the photons, things are not that easy. That's just like particles with a given frequency, of course. We have to solve Maxwell equations to a given medium. And for uh, phonons, mechanical waves is the same. We have to solve the displacement field wave equation. This, here you can see this is the electric field and the magnetic field. In these equations, U is the displacement field. Is, uh, let's say, if you have a particle at this position and at one time, let's say, okay, where is that particle in a moment later? So we can calculate that resolving this, this equation. Okay, for plane waves propagating in homogeneous bulk media or free space for in the case of electromagnetic waves because, as I told you, mechanical waves cannot propagate in, in vacuum. For plane waves, uh, you probably know that electromagnetic waves are like this. They have an oscillating electric field and magnetic field. They propagate uh, along this direction, in this case, the side of the direction. And the electric field and magnetic field are perpendicular. 
between them, and they are also perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Okay, one of the, these are some of the quantities that describe the electromagnetic waves in, in vacuum. Wave number and the refractive index that gives the, the speed of the electromagnetic wave in a given medium. For mechanical waves, okay, we have, for example, longitudinal waves in this case. In this case, U is the displacement field, as you I told you before. You can think as U as an analogy to the electric and magnetic field. So this is the quantity that we are looking at. In this case, U, this should be a parallel symbol because, as you can see in this animation, U is in the same direction as the propagation direction of the mechanical wave. We can also have transverse waves, as in the case of uh, electromagnetic waves. They have this, this shape. And there are also, are also another kind of, of waves, which are, for example, surface waves, that have both components. Okay. What do you think this is? What does this remind you to? This is the sea. This is waves in the sea. Okay, so we are talking waves in, in free space. So in free space, waves, uh, they have no constraints. They can move everywhere they want. You can think uh, an analogy to this is like you are in, in the field, in the countryside, so you can go like everywhere uh, with no problem. Now I'm going to introduce you the concept of waveguide. <laughs> in waveguides, we have constraints for these fields, both electromagnetic or mechanical waves. Only limited frequencies and form of the wave can propagate in the waveguide. So let's think that you, instead of being in the field, in a countryside, you are now in a, in a corridor, let's say. So in a corridor, you can only move in one direction, right? Also, let's say that this corridor is very narrow. You can only move in one direction, but also probably you need to uh, adapt to the shape of that corridor. Okay, so the same happens with electromagnetic and mechanical waves. For example, this is a um, rectangular waveguide with conducti conductive walls. Uh, for example, an optical fiber is also a, a waveguide. Here you can see this is the, the intensity fields of light inside of the optical fiber. So as you can see, they have like, really different shapes. And they only co can propagate in these shapes. They cannot propagate like mm, however they want. In waveguides, we have that the electric and magnetic fields are no longer transverse to each other, and also they are not transverse to the uh, propagation direction. As an analogy to the free space, uh, instead of the wave number, now we have the propagation constant that is given by the effective index of the medium, and the effective index of the medium is dependent on the wavelength of the, of the electromagnetic wave that is propagating in the medium, and also in the mode. These are the different modes. For a mechanical waveguide, it's also the same. Uh, we can have longitudinal uh, waves, which are parallel to the uh, propagation direction. We can have also flexural waves, that are the displacement field is transverse to the propagation direction. But there also can be another different uh, kind of waves, like torsional and radial. Okay, I'm going to do here a, a little break. Have you ever heard about this, Tacoma Bridge Collapse? Okay, I'm curious about what the, did I told you about this. Someone wants to? That's, that's the thing I, I wanted to, <laughs> to hear. So usually, uh, teachers, or not only teachers, but a lot of people, they put this as an example of a resonance phenomenon. This was not a resonance phenomenon. Phenomenon, I will tell you later why. But I mean, the main thing of this of this video is I want you to see this kind of, of mechanical waves propagating in a real medium, which is a bridge. So for those of you know uh, who, who doesn't know, this was a bridge in in Tacoma, in Washington that collapsed uh, because of wind. As you can see yeah, in the video, 
on, on November 7 of 1940, uh, the bridge collapsed. So, as you can see, vertical vibration or flexural vibration, as I showed you before. This is a torsional vibration. You can see that it changed from a totally perpendicular movement to a, this kind of, and what happened in the end is collapse. Because the bridge was not, uh, was not built to, to hold this kind of, of torsional waves. So yes, as I told you before, this is not a, a resonance phenomenon. In resonance phenomenon, the driving force has the same frequency of the natural frequency of the of the system you are moving. For example, in this, how do you call this in English? In Columbia? A swing? A swing is, I think, okay. So in this case, the force has the same frequency as the movement of the bridge, of the, of the thing. Uh, in this case, the force was only, was, was wind. Which wind with a given uh, velocity, but it was not modulated in time. So this was, this is not a resonance uh, phenomenon. There are a lot of theories to, to explain this. You can look for it. For the setting, aerodynamic instability. But the only thing I wanted you to, to see was like this kind of, of waves in, in a real medium. Okay, so now we are going to talk about optical fibers. So you, told, you said me that you know what is an optical fiber. In case there is someone that doesn't know what is an optical fiber, here I have an optical fiber. You can take a look at it. This is a plastic opti optical fiber. So, for example, if you look at here, what do you see? What color do you see? Okay, what color do you see now? You see blue, right? Yeah. It's the blue from here. If I go like this, you probably see another color, right? I don't know. You can play with it. You can just pass it around. So that's an optical fiber. If you play with it, you can see that optical fibers uh, guide light. So how do optical fibers guide light? Okay, uh, through the phenomenon of total reflection, total internal reflection. So w when you have a medium that has a slightly uh, higher index than the outer medium, light can be totally reflected inside this medium, and then you can guide light. But also, uh, optical fibers are also mechanical wave guides because of their shape, the geometry. So we can have also this kind of uh, waves in optical fiber, longitudinal, torsional, flexural. Mm, just to, to show you, <laughs> let's say that this is an optical fiber. <laughs> so for example, longitudinal waves, they are parallel to the direction of propagation. So it should be something like this. Do you see the waves? If I go like this, you can see it. That's a longitudinal wave. Okay. Flexural waves, for example. This is a flexural wave. As you can see, the direction of the displacement field is transverse to the propagation of the of the wave. Okay, the torsional are a bit difficult to see. You have to twist the the spring like this, but I think you can you, you have an idea of how this works, right? Okay. So in optical fibers, we can have this kind of mechanical waves. Okay, what happens when we have both the optical waves and the mechanical waves in optical fiber? That they can interact between each other. But first, before talking about the interaction itself, how can we how can we generate? Waves in optical fiber. Someone has some ideas? Uh, With them? Different pressure. In pressure? Okay. Mm, by external pressure or how? Hmm? I mean, if you have different pressures in an optical fiber, maybe you can generate mm, waves, but they are probably going to be like really weak. There are simpler, simpler things to do it. The simplest one 
is with temperature. If you increase the temperature of the fiber, there's going to be these uh, vibrations of the molecules that form the fiber, and that's going to originate mechanical waves. Another way to do it is, as I told you, with the spring. Just shaking the fiber. This is a piezoelectric device. When you apply a voltage to this device, it starts vibrating. If you put in contact with the, with the fiber, you can generate a mechanical wave in the fiber. But there is uh, a coolest thing of doing this. Any ideas? Sound. With? Sound. sound. I mean, mechanical waves are sound. You can generate. Mm, I mean, this is a way of generating, actually, a mechanical wave with sound, because you're generating sound with this. Any ideas? OK, we're talking about sounds, about light. So, light. You can generate acoustic waves using just light. So, if an intensical optical pulse is propagated inside the fiber, there is a phenomenon called electrostition that is just simply... When you have an, a dielectric material and you apply the electric field, the charts are displaced, right? OK. If you put an intense optical pulse inside a fiber, like really, really intense, you can generate a shock wave inside the fiber and generate me mechanical waves. And you don't need anything else. No, you don't need any kind of uh, temperature chamber. You don't need any device. Just using light. OK, so let's talk about now about the interaction between uh, light and mechanical waves. So the first one, let's see how light interacts with flexural waves, which are this one, the one that is transverse to the, to the propagation direction. OK, when light encounters an, a flexural wave, it, if it has the proper frequency, you can couple light from the core of the optical fiber, this is the inside, to the cladding. The cladding is the outer medium, which is also silica, but the index is slightly uh, lower. OK, what happens when you couple light to the external medium? OK, so usually fibers are covered by the polymer protecting film that absorbs light. So light that is in the cladding will interact with the plastic and will be absorbed. So if you take a look at the, tra at the transmittance spectrum, when you put a flexural uh, wave in a fiber, you can see that there are these notches. These notches are frequencies where light is, is lost because of this coupling to the cladding. So we can fabricate notch filters or reton filters. Let's say that you don't want a given, uh, a given frequency of light. You can tune the frequency of the mechanical wave and reject that uh, wavelength. OK. So how do light interact with acoustic torsional waves? OK, in this case, what happens is that light that is polarized in a given direction is coupled to the same mode, the same mode, the fundamental mode, but polarization in the, other, in the other direction. This is just an example of an experimental setup. Mm, the only thing I want you to see here is that this is the input light. You see a flat uh, spectrum of light. When they interact with the torsional wave, of course, it will change the polarization state. If you put a polarizer at the output, depending on the orientation of the polarizer, you will have a notch filters, like in this case, but also a band bandpass filters. Let's say that instead of rejecting a wavelength, now you only want to have one wavelength. Then you can just turn the, the polarizer to another position, and you pass from a notch filter to a bandpass filter. OK, now let's talk about uh, interaction with longitudinal waves. This is probably one of the most uh, known interactions of light with, with sound, or mechanical waves, which is called backward beyond scattering. So backward beyond scattering, in backward beyond scattering, light is coupled to the backwards direction, so light is reflected. 
For example, in optical communications, you don't want this because in optical communications for internet or whatever, you want the maximum amount of light transmitted, not reflected. So you usually need to avoid this. But um, in science, there are some applications for this. If you take a look of the spectrum of the reflected wave, you will see that the frequency of this light is slightly uh, detuned from the input light. Usually in optical fibers, this detuning is around 10 gigahertz. Okay, with this detuning, you can do uh, a lot of things. You can do, for example, distributed sensing. The position of this detuning uh, frequencies are dependent on the temperature and the strain on the fiber, so you can use that as a sensor for temperature and strain. You can also use them to build um, bridging fiber lasers and amplifiers because both ways, the forward propagating wave and the backward propagating wave, uh, interferes between them. And you can use that to fabricate uh, amplifiers and lasers. Okay, the last one, uh, the last iteration is with, with radial waves. I didn't talk about radial waves uh, before, I'm going to do it now. Radial waves uh, are waves that are confined in transverse direction of the optical fiber. It's like a, like a heart pumping, like something like this. Thing about these waves is that they, no pro they don't propagate along the along the, um, the optical fiber. They only uh, vibrate in a transverse direction. The interaction of the, these acoustic radial waves with light is known as forward viewing scattering, and as you can you imagine, because the light is scattered in the same direction. In this case, I mean, we know that this exists because there is also a shift in the, in the frequency of the input light with the scattered one. But in this case, uh, instead of having a really uh, good uh, new frequency, we have several frequencies, very narrow, and in the range of 30 uh, megahertz to 1,000 megahertz. So the frequencies are lower than in this case. Uh, we can use this to, to characterize the elastic properties of the, of the fiber. The high quality factor of these resonances, uh, let's say it's the, the ratio between the line width of the, of the frequency and the frequency. So as they are very narrow, they have really high quality factors. And you can use this to measure uh, with high accuracy some elastic properties of the fiber. And also they can be used as in the same way of backward region scattering as sensors of uh, temperature and strain. So I'm going to talk uh, a little more about this because this is what I, I do in my research group. I'm going to show you just some ideas I want you to have. I don't want to get into detail in this. So as I told you before, acoustic radial waves are waves that they do not propagate in the, in the fiber axis, in the set direction. So they only have components, let's say, in the X and Y or in the radial and the angular uh, directions. These are some uh, animations of different modes for these uh, acoustic radial waves. I hope they work. OK. As you can see, this is the fundamental mode. As you can see, the frequency is, 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 is really low compared to the other ones. This is the radial mode of order 3, order 5, and order 10. As you can see, the order gives the number of, of of maximums that have the, 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 the mechanical wave. OK, so now we have these transverse waves in the optical fiber. This is the displacement field. This displacement field gives a density variation inside the optical fiber. And this density variation in the optical fiber will modulate the optical properties of the, of the material through a phenomenon known as photoelasticity. Do you know what's this? What are we looking at here? It's a spoon, but what are these colors? OK. Let's see it. Let's turn on one of Solo quiero que sujetes una. 
Voy a poner esto entre medias. Ok, do you know what's this? Ok. So we have two polarizers. Now, they are parallel to each other. What happens if we cross them? As you can see, there is no light. Okay, let's use this to see elastic properties in this ruler, in this plastic ruler. Okay, so let's put the ruler between the two polarizers. Okay, pues lo que sujetas el de atrás, yo creo. Okay. Can you see it? Come here. Do you see all those colors? Those colors are elastic deformations in the plastic during the manufacturing process. And as you can see, these elastic stresses modulate the properties of the light. Okay, if you want to play with it, you can just... <laughs> I know you like playing. <laughs> Okay, so I just showed you that the elastic deformations or density variations affect the optical properties of the of the material, in our case, the optical fiber. Okay, but let's say, how can we measure this experimentally? Because, okay, that's that's really cool, but how can we measure, like, properly? Okay, so in our uh, laboratory, we use uh, this approach. We try to convert this uh, refractive index variations due to the mechanical wave or the elastic deformation, we try to convert in some kind of resonant wavelength variation. So for doing that, uh, we have some devices that has uh, resonant wavelengths. Resonant wavelengths, if this is the transmi transmitted power, there is a frequency or a wavelength where the transmitted power is lost. Okay. Let's say that this resonant wavelength depends on the refractive index of the material. Okay, what happens when you uh, put a mechanical wave in this device? What will happen to this uh, wavelength? Any ideas? Okay. It will shift. So what happens if we put another laser, let's say in the slope of this spectrum, we put a tunable laser at this point? So we will see a variation in the transmittance of the of light. Okay, thank you. <laughs> we will see a variation of the transmittance of light. Okay, some of the devices are are shown here. I'm not going to to get into into detail, but there are like long period of ratings and fiber bar ratings. We fabricate these ones like putting a small index perturbation in the core of the fiber using an ultraviolet laser. In this case, light is coupled to the cladding, like in the flexural wave, if you remember, but in this case, just with a density perturbation. In fire black ratings, light is reflected. And these are special kind of, of devices that are called whispering LED modes. In this case, this is a transverse uh, profile of a fiber. In this case, light, instead of propagating through the fiber axis, it travels in the, let's say, in the perimeter of the fiber. So you can put also light not only in the direction of the fiber, but also in the perimeter. In all these cases, they all have this kind of a spectrum, so we can use any of these to do this kind of, of experiment. As I told you, what we are going to expect to see is a variation in the transmittance of the, of the signal, and this is what we see. If we take a look at an, an oscilloscope to a transmitted signal, we see these variations. These variations are caused by the mechanical wave that we have inside the fiber. And if you take a look at the spectrum of this, if you do some kind of Fourier transform to this temporal trace, you actually, you actually see the different acoustic resonances that you have in the fiber. As you can see, there are a lot of resonances. In the range from 0 to 1 gigahertz, there are a lot of resonances. From this spectrum, we actually see two kinds of, uh, of waves. 
the radial ones that I told you before, which only have the displacements field in the radial direction, but there are also torsional radial, a mix of, the, of both of them, which are these that are between the, the most intense ones. So these uh, other acoustic resonances, they have both angular and radial uh, components. And both of them have different properties. We will exploit later to, to see some applications. For example, we can measure Poisson ratio in optical favors. Poisson ratio is only the, it gives the deformation of a material in directions perpendicular to the direction of loading. Let's say this, this picture. So if we apply a strain in a material in a given direction, in the other direction there will be also a strain, but in the opposite, with the opposite sign. So the Poisson ratio, what gives is the, the ratio between these two, these two strains. So in optical fibers, it's really, it's really hard to, to measure this, this kind of, of, um, of properties, of elastic properties, because they are really small. Usually, if you want to measure this in a, I don't know, say in a bulk sample, in a big sample, you can measure miss this just like taking measurements of the distance that you are, when you put a strain in one direction, you can, okay, let's say that we have the strain is two centimeters and the other direction, it's one centimeter. You can calculate Poisson ratio, but in optical fibers it's really difficult because they are really small. But we can use the properties of these acoustic uh, waves inside the fiber to calculate this. So Poisson ratio can be calculated also using the CR and longitudinal acoustic velocities, are two, proper two different properties of, of solids are the velocities at which transverse and longitudinal waves are propagating in, the, in, a, in a medium, which are different. And the thing is that the radial modes are proportional to the longitudinal veloc velocity, and the torsional radial modes are proportional to the shear velocity. So we can combine the measurements of these two frequencies to calculate the Poisson ratio. So this is Poisson ratio of optical fiber in a range from minus 20 to 80 Celsius degrees, and we obtain a very high accuracy. The relative errors is less than one per thousand, which is it's really, really, really big. Another uh, application is strain and temperature sensing. Uh, not only sensing, but simultaneous and discriminative measurement of strain and temperature. So for measuring the strain, we apply a uh, strain in one direction to the fiber, and for measuring the displacement with temperature, we put the fiber inside a temperature chamber. Okay, what we are going to see is that the resonances are going to displace because of this strain and because of the temperature. Uh, in this case, you can see a radial acoustic waves, the mode order 10, how it displays with temperature in this case and with a strain in this case. So the same we can, we can look with the torsional radial waves. In this case for temperature, in this case for, for strain. So the sensor we fabricated using this, this method uh, has an accuracy of 0 0.2 uh, Celsius degrees and 25 uh, microstrains. Just to, to finish, I'm going to show you another two applications. These are from other research groups. This is not our research group. One of them is sensing of liquids outside of uh, fibers. So the thing is that the reflectance of the acoustic waves depends on the outer medium that you have around the fiber. So as you can see, this is the temporal trace and this is the, the spectrum of one, of one resonance. In, the case, in this case, it's for ethanol and water. You can see that in the case of water, the acoustic wave damping is higher. And what also happens is that the resonance broads with the, depending on the medium you have uh, in the surroundings of the fiber. So you can use this to measure the, actually, to measure the impedance, the acoustic impedance of the outer medium, and then know what uh, kind of, of liquid you have outside. And the last application that is maybe more exotic is sensing of gamma radiation. 
So there are also applications of this uh, kind of acoustic waves to sensing gamma radiation. What they do is they put a coating around the fiber, a, flu fluoroacryl a fluoroacrylate coating, okay. So this coating is sensitive to gamma radiation. And what happens is that the acoustic wave velocity at this coating will change with the gamma radiation dose. So what we can see is this is a temporal trace again, like this one and the previous ones. The blue one uh, is the reference with no, no dose of gamma radiation and when dif with different doses. So you can see this is the main oscillation that is caused when the optical wave goes to this boundary, the boundary between silica and the coating and goes back. And this secondary one is the one that between the two boundaries of the coating, between the silica coating bo uh, boundary and the coating uh, air boundary. As you can see, this one, they all arrive at the same time, but the second one gets delayed with gamma radiation. Here you can see uh, a graph uh, with this delay. So what we see is that the acoustic waves travels faster as we put gamma radiation into the sample. So we can use this to calculate the radiation dose of, of gamma radiation. And that's all I wanted to, to talk to you about today. Some conclusions about this talk. Electromagnetic and mechanical waves can interact in media in many different ways. Optical fibers are excellent medium to do this kind of interaction. Mechanical waves can modulate light as well as light can excite mechanical waves in optical fibers, which is really interesting. And in particular, the acoustic radial waves are generating uh, a growing interest in the recent years due to the numerous applications that they have. So that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I will be glad to, to answer them. Thank you for the, the presentation. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I guess we can answer a couple of questions. So, uh, About the uh, wavelength displacement, uh, is it uh, in some way um, proportional to the uh, difference in fre frequency of uh, light and acoustic wave? Uh, because uh, if uh, it's an elastic scattering... Of course, of, uh, of course it is. I, of, of course it is, but it's really difficult to see it properly. For example, in the games, there's another interaction with acoustic waves, which is Rama, Raman uh, scattering. Oh. I didn't talk about that because uh, those kinds of acoustic waves are more microscopic instead of macroscopic, like in this case. But in, this, in that case, the frequency shift in the, in the light is really big. So you can actually see in an optical spectrum analyzer, you can see the, the displacement. Okay. In this case, the displacement is 30 kilohertz or 30 megahertz or 1 gigahertz. So actually, it's difficult to see in an optical okay. spectrum analyzer this seed, but it's there. Yeah, of course, it is. I mean, energy and momentum is conserved. Any other questions? In the um, whispering gallery mode, mm -hmm. the function was a Lorentzian function as well. Sorry, the, yeah. the, the function, when you were explaining the um, fiber bra gratings yeah. and whispering gallery mode, there was some functions. Oh, okay, let me. Okay, this, fact, this yes. do you mean these pictures, right? Yeah. These are the, transmi the transmission spectrum of these devices. Mm -hmm. And is the, in the whispering guy mode, in yeah. particular, is the transmission spectrum a Lorentzian function? Uh, I'm not sure about, about it, honestly. I think it's not a Lorentzian function. In the case of the acoustic resonances, they are Lorentzian function. In the case of a whispering guy mode, I don't think it's a Lorentzian function. Another thing of this picture, I, I didn't talk about it, but it's also plot. I don't know if you can see the the line width of this transmission spectrum. In the case of a long period grating, it's one nanometer, but in the case of whispering gallery modes, it's 60 femtometers. They are really, really narrow and really, really sensitive. Mm 
So a fun funny thing about this, when we are using this kind of of devices in the laboratory to, to do some experiments, if the drum is going, we cannot measure because of the vibrations of everything. <laughs> it's so sensitive that even we have an optical table and it's supposed to be isolated. When the drum uh, passes away, we cannot measure. We have to wait. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for the presentation. And uh, the next one.